Lord, we've been on our series of serenity prayer, learning how to accept life on its terms. Serenity prayer says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change. Give me courage to keep on changing the things that I can, and wisdom to know the difference. And we learn to live one day at a time, and enjoy one moment at a time. Accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. And now we've been up to the point where it says, trusting that you will make all things good if I surrender to your will. So there's basically two parts to this. First part says that we're trusting you. That means we're looking to God our Father, our Provider, to uh, give us some help, taking our messages, taking our messes, and turning our messes into messages. How many of you have made some messes out there before? Uh, okay. One of the great facts about God being sovereign is that Romans 8, 28 says that God causes, or can cause, all things to work together for good. He can make all things right. To those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose or according to His design or predetermined plan. Uh, I want to talk tonight a little bit about deviation. Hearing that word all along. All day long. This uh, Romans 8 28 is all as a promise, but it's based on certain prerequisites. One is that we love God and those who are called according to his determined plan. I was thinking about this timeline thing. God has a predetermined plan, all right, or a divine destiny for everybody. It's providential. Predetermined, prearranged, preappointed plan that God has for all of us, and it was a game plan or a strategy that God had before the foundation of the earth. And God as being sovereign is going to be seeing to it, uh, watching over those who that he called according to his purpose, those that he chose before the foundation of the world. He had a predetermined plan. So God has been watching over those that he predetermined or prearranged before time. And he's been seeing to it that all things work together for good. Uh, like I said, God chose me before the foundation of the world. And he determined right here that, that I would end up in heaven, in a glorified state. Those who we predetermined, those he called, those he called, he justified, and those that he justified, he glorified. That was all determined before I was ever even born. Okay. But about the time I so I got saved at the age of six, which was a, a big choice. That was the day where I joined I joined in. Okay. The Amplified actually says that all things are fitting all things uh, are we are assured and we know that all things being a partner in labor with God, that all things work together, are fitting together into a wonderful, beautiful plan for those that love God and those who call according to His purpose. So I made a really good decision here. But then about 10 years old, I, I deviated. Started smoking cigarettes and chasing girls and did all that. And that sent me in a direction. 
know. Uh, you know, I got back on track somewhere in here. And, uh, then about 19, when I was in college, I remember God, God's hand coming heavy, heavy on me. Right in the middle of college, I'm saying, man, Right now, my heyday, you know, and here, here you want to come on me, and and I got, you know, I, I, uh, I remember having made a decision right there, you know, that I just wasn't ready. You know, I still had a lot of partying left in me, so I made a very bad choice that day. At about 21, I made another choice, a good choice. I recommitted my life to the Lord, got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that went along pretty good until about the time I was about 26. And I got bitter over God and frustrated. Saw all my buddies out there drinking, carrying on, doing their things. And here I am in a cookies and Kool-Aid party on a Friday night. So, uh, you know, I made a, a big decision that day. Uh, it took me... about 36. <clears throat> I was already into crack cocaine and drinking heavy. As a matter of fact, I was in Cape Canaveral Hospital trying to detox. At that time, I had a paid-for condo. <laughs> I had a beautiful poor, poor white Corvette. I had a 401k. I had good health. I could have easily, uh, you know, stopped right here turn my life around. I remember God's hand being heavy on me. And for whatever reason, man, I just still, you know, wasn't ready. So that went on for another two years. And finally I made a I made a good decision and I went to Dunkin'. And in 40 years, I made a decision after Dunkin' to carry on. And eventually that plan brought me back here where I am today at 65 years old. So God, even though I made a lot of messes and deviations and got way off course, because I repented right here and began to love God and began to get back in line and joint partnership back onto the predetermined plan God has, uh, not my plan, but get back on the God's plan. God brought me back here. So all these things, uh, God has taken these things and he's constantly taking every decision that I've made, made them all work together, fitting back into a predetermined plan. Uh, and God's going to continue to accomplish in this very thing that he who began a good work will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. So God... Uh, Started that plan, he got me back to that plan, and God will carry on to that plan. Uh, but you know, I started thinking, you know, uh, what about what about these what ifs? Call them the woulda, coulda, shouldas. What about it stopped right here when I was 19? You know, was it really in? I mean, I could have in school then and went to be a pro baseball player. I could have been, went to law school. I mean, I could have, who knows? But I didn't. I made a choice. I mean, our choice determines our destiny. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right that one down. Our choices determine destiny, not just happen, you know, things just don't happen. Our choices, by and large, determine our Destiny. I'm in charge of my destiny because of my choices. Then I started thinking about what I, you know, would have done, you know, right here, but mainly right here when I was sitting in Cape Canaveral Hospital. I remember, I was, like I said, I still had all those things, but I kept on, kept on, kept on, and, and within two years, I, I lost my condo, my vet, for everything that I left. So basically, I was dead broke. So at 40, I went back to Dublin. So I got three questions for all of us tonight. One is, where, where would you be today 
on your timeline if you had made a decision to go deeper and not different? How I many of Christian life is about going deeper or different? And we, we get to these choices that we make and we can either go deeper with God and get through it and keep going, keep growing, stay on God's plan, or we can keep going different. I was a man that went different all my life. But like I say, finally I made a good decision and God has made it work together. So where would you be today if you had gone deeper? I think this will be a really good homework assignment for you guys to do a timeline if you, if you want to. Where would you be today if you had you know, cheated on your wife? What would have been today if you hadn't got that felony charge? What would it be today if you had went to college? What if, what if, what if? Well, the elephant had wings, it'd be a big bird, wouldn't it? So we can't do anything about that. So where will you be tomorrow? So if you've got here and now God's brought you now you've made a decision here and you're at Liberty Lodge and you keep making those good choices uh, you know where, where will, you know, eventually that will if you begin to love God and repent then eventually they'll get back to you on track and you know what's your life going to look like and the third question is where, where are you going to be if you don't So you're right here and you're making good choices, but how do you know you can you can make another bad choice again? You can walk right out of Liberty Lodge today. I mean, you know, I've worked all this thing and here I am right here, 65 years old, but and I and I and I've still got a ways to go, but how do you know I can deviate today? One drink. One little deviation of compromise, one drink. I got 27 years clean as of yesterday. Amen. 27 years without a drink, drug, having been with a woman, been, been clean. All that has happened because of this choice that I just kept, going. instead of going different, I made a decision that I'm going to unconditionally surrender my life to Him, start doing the things I need to be in. So it took me 20, 27 years, and, I, and I'm back here. but. You know, I, I still got to keep, I still got a ways to go. So where would you be if you had made all these choices? Who knows? We can't do anything about the past, but we can do something about the future. And where are you going to be if you quit tonight? Amen? Amen. Amen. So choice, not chance, determines our destiny. So let's go. So... So, so, our prayer says that we're trusting God, that God will make all these things right if we will surrender to His will, unconditional will. If, 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 the, the big if. So God will make all, God will do His part if we'll do our part. God will see to it that He makes everything. He'll get us right back on track. There may be some consequences. There may be some things. But in that, God can still make all that. You may have had abortions. You may have had divorces. You may have been homosexual, you may have felonies, you may, you may have all kinds of messes, but somehow God is able to make all that together in that stuff and still get you back and see to it that you get to heaven. And another condition is if, 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 I call it a big if, if we will surrender to his will. How I many know it's not, it's not my will, but God's will. When are we going to learn that? God will do His part if I will do my part. Jesus Himself, you know, had a, a time on His His destiny. Jesus knew He knew who He was. He knew where he came from. He knew why he was here. You know, he was going back to. He knew that there was a predetermined plan, and that his plan was he had to make it to the cross. 
you got 30, 33 years basically carrying out the destiny and the plan that God had for him. He said, my will is to do the will of him who sent me. That's it. That was his purpose. What's your will and purpose you're for life? My will is to do what he says to you. It's to do his will, not my will. Okay, so he lived on that. You know, it's not about me. I've come for a plan. I've got a purpose. I've got to stay on course. I can't deviate. I can't quit. I've got to keep going deeper, deeper, deeper. I can't go deeper. So, so all of a sudden, he, 33 years, and he gets right here and he goes, oh, goodness. Reality's here, baby. You know, he knew he was going to the cross and he was getting ready to take on the sins of mankind. Okay. And so he's in the Garden of Eden and, you know, he's praying, he's sweating drops of blood, he's He's on his knees. He said, oh, Lord, man, and it's here, man. I don't know. I don't know about this thing. If, if there's any way, if you, can, if you can go, if you can come up with a different plan, <laughs> you know, we can change this plan a little bit. We can do a, a, a change order, you know, and make some adjustments. Uh, can we do it another way? He says, but if it's got to be this way, then nevertheless, it's not my will, but thy will be done. And he did it a couple different times. Uh, but finally he said, finally he got to the point, says, you know, I've been going deeper this far. Going de a deviation is, is not an option. So I'm going to press on through this thing. He know he pressed on through this thing. And then it says he, you know, uh, was ascended into heaven. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't deviate? Amen. And so there's a crisis. Uh, Jesus had a crisis of the will. And, you know, we have crises of the will. We say it's crisis because once, once we become gods, then we're on a predetermined plan. That means his hand is on us and you, we can't get away with anything. Okay? And so whether we read the fine print or not, when we signed up with God, it was no longer our will. We were no longer on our own throne, being our own God. running our, You know, we realized that we became... His and we are not our own. It's not okay for us to run on. Okay. So, uh, so we finally you know, realized that it wasn't about my will, that it had to be His way. It couldn't be my way anymore. It had to be His way. And so there's this crisis when we, when we step into the kingdom of God and we become God, it becomes a crisis because now uh, it's not going to go good for me. I can't win fighting God. It's not going to do me a bit of good to keep fighting God. Keep wrestling over the steering wheel. I can keep trying, I can keep doing, and I can keep doing these things, but all it's going to do is get me hurt more and more and more. And somewhere I'm going to have to realize that I can't fight, fight God and win. I mean, that we can't fight God and win. So tonight, I want to talk about unconditional surrender. It's going to be called the fatal blow. I mean, no resistance is futile. And <laughs> like the, the board, resistance is futile. You will be assimilated. Basically, what they're saying is you can come easy, be assimilated, or you can become hard, but you will be assimilated, so make a choice. I mean, you know, when, when we belong to God, it, you know, it, now that we're His, it, it can, we can go easy, or it can go real hard. We can get in front of the truck, uh, sit next to Jesus, let Him be the pilot, be the co-pilot, let Him do the driving, or we can wrestle back and forth with that steering wheel. Or I can just keep wrestling on the steering wheel or get, get behind the truck and get dragged through some more mud and keep getting dragged. And every now and then he'll stop and say, you all right back there? Oh yeah, I'm good. Keep on, keep on going. <laughs> wouldn't, it much, much, wouldn't it be much easier to just say, hold it, stop. Let me, okay, let me just get up front. Just turn the AC on. Let me get cleaned up and let me just get on. Wouldn't it be so much easier just to tap out? So I don't talk about tapping out. I found my UFC hat. 
got my UFC gloves here. Pretty cool, huh? I had to go beat up Conor McGregor to get them. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember watching the, the UFC when, when it was, uh, it wasn't even the UFC then, it was back then, it was the Batman's contest or whatever, you know. And, you know, I think the first one they had like eight guys. Uh, you know, they were all competed, and last man standing was going to win. And uh, you know, they threw him in the octagon. And back then, there was no real rules. You know, they didn't even really have gloves. You know, and so it was, it was pretty, pretty boot brutal back in those days. You know, uh, so finally they had to add some rules and some different things. But, but when you're when you're in the octagon, you know, you got two choices, you know. You can either, actually you got three choices. You can either knock them out and make them submit and tap out, or they're going to knock me out and make me tap out. It's a 50-50 chance, one of the two, okay, it's not going to happen. I'm either going to knock them out or they're going to knock me out. And knocked out, it's not too much fun, or I can just tap out. If you notice when they're doing their things, Matthew, you ready to tap out? Ooh. I, was a, I was a lover, I wasn't much of a fighter, that's for sure. Definitely can't today. But when, if you watch that referee, he's, he's on top of this thing, and, and uh, nowadays that referee is looking for, for one of two things. He's looking to find out if this guy is, is unconscious, as he's been knocked out, is he done? Or I keep letting him go, or he's looking for what? He's looking for those three fingers. You know. And as soon as he sees them three fingers more than anything, he jumps in there and knocks the other guy off, and it's done over. If, if the guy keeps going like in the older days, if you don't tap out, I mean, it gets brutal. They'll rip your arm off practice. Knock your shoulder out of joint. I've seen bones broken. I've seen teeth knocked out. I, people have even died because they just keep on keeping on. Blow after blow after blow after blow. <laughs> you know, not quitting, which is admirable, but it's pretty stupid if it makes you paralyzed for the rest of your life. And, you know, you walk around like with a broken arm and, uh, you know, and teeth, no teeth, and you know, you have to think, well, you know, was it all worth it? And so, you know, Jesus is, is the, I call it God's octagon. Okay, we're all in the octagon of God's predetermined plan for our lives, and he's the referee, and we're in the octagon, and, and uh, you know, we're either going to, we're going to either keep fighting God and, and keep uh, doing things our way, you know, and, and we're going to get knocked out, and suffer consequences, you know, or we just want to tap out. I can come easy, tap out, or I can keep fighting God. The thing is, now that I'm a born again Christian, things are changed. I am not my own. I belong to Him, and it's not okay. So it's not going to go good. So wouldn't it be just much easier, you know? 27 years ago, I finally just did that. It was that simple. That's all God was waiting for. Yeah. If I had tapped out two years earlier, you know, I wouldn't have had hepatitis C. I wouldn't have, you know, I'd had some money. I would have had some relationships. I would have had some people, and who knows? But I just had to keep on fighting. I had to keep on fighting. I had to keep doing things my way, and I suffered consequences. I still suffer consequences today for my choices. So let me ask you today, you know, are you, are you, how are you doing? Are you, are you fighting God or have you tapped out? You know, unconditional surrender means there's no terms, no conditions, no mediations, no rebuttal, no nothing. It's simply, I'm done. I tap out. You know, I fought and fought, I tapped out, I fought, I tapped out, but there was, there was a fatal blow. I mean, what the fatal blow is, you know, you get popped, you get popped, you get popped, and you know, and all of a sudden, then there's that one boy that just knocks you out cold. And you could have tapped out, but you didn't tap out. So 
so now you've been knocked out. I don't know about you, I'd rather be tapping out than be knocked out. Amen? Amen. So let's turn to Genesis tonight. So let's get ready to rumble tonight. Anybody ready to rumble? Oh, yeah. Tonight we're going to look at the story of Jacob. of Genesis. <clears throat> We're going to talk about the fatal blow tonight. Jacob was a man uh, and he was broke, but it took him forever to be broken. How I many you know he can be broke without being broken? He was a man that was hard-headed, stiff-necked, kept fighting, kept fighting, very strong-willed, hard-headed, everything had to be his way or the highway, and, and it didn't go too good for him. But in the long run, because of God's providence, because he repented and began to love God and got back online with, in track with God and he tapped out, then even though he had consequences, he finished well. So in Je Je uh, Genesis 32, Jacob is running from his brother, Esau, whom he tricked out of his birthright. Basically, I'll make him a cup of porridge. Esau gave up his birthright over, he made a choice to go different rather than deeper all over, all over some porridge. How many of you messed up your life all over some all over one drink or one woman or one hit of crack or one shot of heroin? You know, one drink, one shot, one won't hurt, one won't do, one wrong woman, one wrong thing. Messed up our whole life. Then at the very end, towards the end, when Isaac's passing out the blessings, uh, him and Rebecca, his mom, got together and they deceived him out of uh, out of the blessing and the the blessing that was irrevocable was transferred to Jacob rather than Esau, and, and Esau, uh, Jacob, uh, Isaac didn't want it that way. Uh, but in the midst of all that, God was in that. Okay, God used that. You ever thought about that? How beautiful Rebecca must have been. She said she was absolutely beautiful. Uh, but even she undermined her husband. <laughs> you know, perfect woman undermines her. Undermines her home on his deathbed. Tells you how evil we can all be. But in verse 24, he's he's running from Esau. He's, he catches wind. Esau's coming to, to town. And boy, you're in trouble now. So now he's freaking. He's uh, trying to play catch up, trying to make up amends. He's thinking all these different things. So he gets all of his people and starts sending you know all these camels ahead of him and all these donkeys ahead of them and you know all these gifts and different things and uh, then he starts marching his uh, wife's and his wife Rachel and uh, Rebecca and Leah and, uh, starts marching them ahead and uh, hopes that as they run into Esau it'll soften his heart and then, then he was marching all the grandkids saying he can't you know <laughs> and, then, and then he's just saying oh my lord tomorrow tomorrow's going to be big you know so here we are in verse 24. He's all by himself. And all of a sudden a man shows up out of nowhere. Or did he really show up out of nowhere? And the man wrestled with him all night long until daybreak. 11 o'clock, this guy shows up and challenges him to a UFC, let's get ready to rumble, in the octagon cage match. Apparently it was pretty good. It was on pay-per-view, I guess, because uh, it lasted all night long. 
And about daybreak, when he, meaning the angel, wasn't a man, actually it was an angel. Perhaps he looked, perhaps it could have been an angel inside of a man, but it was an angel. And when he, the angel, saw that he had not prevailed, that he wasn't winning. <laughs> and it was even Stephen, back and forth, blow for blow. You know, and this thing went all night, a black eye, exchanging one punch after another. We're talking about an all-out, just a, a war, a feud. And when he saw that he wasn't prevailing against him, it says he touched his, the socket of his, of his hip or his thigh, and he dislocated it. Put him at a disadvantage. That's like a sucker punch or, or gouging someone's eye or pulling their hair when you're fighting. It's, you know, but I guess this angel was a little shifty. You know. But he saw he wasn't winning, so he went to plan B and he he uh, he hurt him. Threw his hip out. While he was wrestling. So so this angel touches his hip and gives him a dislocated bit. Here, Jacob just keeps on fighting. Right on the daybreak. Then the angel finally said, let me go. It's, it's dawn. The dawn's about to break. Uh, I've got breakfast waiting in heaven. I've got to get back up there with the rest of the angels. Let me go. Let me go. Doesn't something sound really crazy about this? Let me go, for the dawn is breaking, but he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob, again, takes advantage of, of a, a, kicks a dead dog when he's down, and he dislocated his hip, and he says, okay, you, you know, but, but you're not, I'm not going to let you tap out that easy. You're going to bless me. That means give me your money, give me your watch, give me, give me everything else you got. <laughs> so he said, and what is your name? And he said, my name is Jacob. And he said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God, with men, and you've prevailed, you've survived, you've outlasted, you've won. You, know, you survived the 10th round, you're still standing. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me what your name is. But he said, why is it important that you want my name? So the angel blessed him anyway, and he left. So Jacob made a decision, and he named that place Peniel, Penel, Peniel. For he said, I have seen the face of God. I wrestled with the angel, but he was smart enough to realize that it wasn't just name, that it was really God that he was wrestling with. <laughs> and he said, I have seen God face to face. I met him in the octagon. I went head to head with him. And I'm still standing. He didn't kill me. He didn't take my life. He didn't break my arm. He didn't finish me off. Yet my life was preserved. That means he showed mercy. He could have killed me. But he did. And all I did was walk away with a dislocated hip. So the sun rose. And he crossed over and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore, to this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh. Let me ask you, okay. So it says that, that Jacob prevailed. Let me ask, did he really prevail? Okay. He wrestled with an angel all night long, and he, you know, and, and, uh, he got blessed, and uh, you know that's good. And he didn't lose his life, you know. Okay, <laughs> but it says that he that he spent the rest of his life, uh, you know, walking with a, a limp, you know, a crutch, you know, and he was remembered throughout eternity, you know, that people remind remembered that story of how Jacob could have tapped out. But instead of getting uh, tapped out, God didn't knock him out, but God did hurt him and dislocate his hip, and he suffered consequences for the rest of his life. You know, walking. And people always quoted the story to that, oh, what a dummy Jacob was. 
He kept fighting God. He kept fighting God. He kept fighting God. And he, he should have known you can't fight God and win. All he had to do was tap out and he could have saved his. But oh no. He just kept on. He kept on. How I many you know you keep on, keep on, keep on? You're going to get knocked out. Sin's going to knock you out. You keep on smoking crack. You keep doing heroin. You keep hanging around the wrong girls, keep going through program after program, you keep going different rather than deeper. Eventually, God's going to be merciful. He's going to prevail. He may not take your life, but eventually you're going to do something stupid and you're going to get hurt. You're going to go to prison. You're going to get killed in a car wreck. You're going to get AIDS. You're going to go through felonies. You're going to keep on, keep on suffering consequences and if you would have just tapped out. I wonder what it would have been like for me if I had just simply tapped out in Cape Canal Hospital. I could have paid for a condo today and a car and 401k and all those things. But no, 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 I had to keep on going. It wasn't God's will. It just kept on doing stupid things. You know, God ain't playing. And so Pino represents the end of our self-will. It, it, re it represents... The place of an unconditional surrender where you tap out unconditionally. That means I don't, you know, Lord, I, I, I'm tapping out. You know, I was finally, you know, when I, when I hit 38 years old, I was, had a visitation myself. And, uh, and that day, uh, I tapped out. I didn't tap out before, but this time I really tapped out. I was done. No terms, no conditions. All I said is, Lord, just pull me out of this mess and I'll give you the rest of my life. I said, I'm done. I get it. I'm, I'm done. I'm hurt enough. I don't want to get any worse. And, you know, I could have tapped out a long time earlier, couldn't have I? And I just kept on, kept on going. So, uh, Penel represents a place where a man comes to, to the end of himself. The word Jacob means supplanter or swindler or a trickster, or more a shyster, a fighter, or a con man. And so here, here, uh, you know, Jacob has his timeline. You know, before he was even born, it says that he wrestled with his brother in the womb. Every, you know, cage match every day. Rebecca's going like this, and you know, these kids are fighting back and forth, and and. Uh, you know, when Esau was born, born first, but it says he, he came out hanging on to his, his legs, you know, fighting to get ahead of him. You know, okay. Yeah. Then we know later on he, uh, so he makes, you know, he's, he's born already being, with the nature of being a deceiver and a trickster, and then he, he cons his brother Esau out of, uh, out of his birthright by offering him a single meal. So he gets sneaky there. Then he kind of uh, tricks him out of his uh, his blessing, his brother. He's getting worse and worse. Then he starts tricking his father-in-law because he won't give Rebecca and Leah to him for wives, so he has to serve seven years. And he starts he starts conniving and shifting the sheep and the, the black sheep and the white sheep and causing them to mate, whatever. And he tricks them out, and all all of a sudden, all his sheep are producing. Uh, sheep, but his, his Laban's aren't. So, you know, and so, uh, you know, then later on in life, you know, he, he suffers the consequence of losing Joseph, his most precious son, and then almost lost Benjamin. You know, so he he gets he deviates and he deviates, but uh, you know, I saw something really interesting. Look at look at Romans nine. Nine Romans nine is all about predestination. I didn't see this till today. This is pretty cool. Romans 9. Verse 11. Since for although they were twins, meaning Esau and Jacob, they were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, but, but so that God's purpose, God's predetermined, predetermined plan according to His own choice would stand, not because of works, but because of Him who calls, God saw to it at Peniel. 
when his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. Listen to what Israel means. Israel, Israel means you're no longer a deceiver, you're no longer a trickster, you're no longer that person anymore. Something's happened to you, your heart has changed, you're a different person now, now you've tapped out, and it says now, now you are a contender with God and man. The word actually means to be a priest or a prince until the end of time. So basically, despite getting dislocated hip and fighting God, he still, because of God's predetermined plan, God allowed the angel to supposedly fail and suppose. You know, I mean, uh, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't whoop no angel. He didn't whoop God. God. God let him go through all that. He could have tapped out, but God's providential plan was that he wouldn't tap out. That he would have to have a dislocated hip. It was all part of the plan because he knew that hip was what it's going to take to get him back to right here and. Hebrews 11, 21 says that at the end of his life, Jacob, you know, after he got Joseph back and saved Benjamin and he went through this, he kissed and made up with Esau, God brought him back, back down on course to the predetermined plan. And right before he dies, it says he, it says he worshiped God, leaning on his staff. You know, he spent the rest of his life with a limb. Could have been different than it was, but either way, it all turned out good. Then I, mean, I don't know if his staff was his crutch or not, but either way, it, it, at the end of his life, how many, how many of you out here tonight would like to end up at the end of your life saying, "Boy, I made a lot of mistakes. I messed up so many times. I screwed so many people over. I did so many things wrong." But you know, I've got such a good God. Despite all my messes, God turned this thing around. You know, and now. I'm finishing strong and it's all good and you can lean on your staff and say all is well with my soul. Amen. So in closing tonight, I, you know, how have you received the fatal blow? Every godly man, if he's ever going to be used by God, is going to have to have his own penial experience where he realizes that he can't find God and he taps out if he's going to be useful by God. So, have you received the fatal blow? Are you done? Have you tapped out? Or are you still want some more? You still keep fighting. Keep on keeping on and you're going to get hurt. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So, let's all close our eyes tonight. Maybe you just like that. Unconditionally, as we pray tonight, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be exactly everything. But, you know, you may be right here at, Liberty Lodge, you may be thinking about leaving, you may be thinking, think about the consequences. Think what's going to happen if you go ahead and leave. You're just going to go back. Where are you going to go? Back to the same old, same old? Or are you going to go deeper with God and get back on God's plan? Come easier, come hard, but you will come. Amen? Amen. Alright, we'll see you. See you! See you! See you.